When you think of heroes of the Holocaust, you might think of Oskar Schindler, the German businessman who rescued over 1,200 Jews from the gas chambers. But while Schindler was saving Jews in Poland, another man found himself thrust into the moral tests of history. He deceived Nazi officials, disobeyed his government, even doled out funds from his own inheritance, all to save strangers with an identity far different from his own. And he came not from Europe, but Iran. So who was this Iranian Schindler? Abdul Hussein Sardari was a strapping young bachelor who loved fine food and beautiful women. Born to a prominent Iranian family, he enjoyed all the benefits of his classification as Persian royalty. From education abroad in England and Switzerland, to profitable political connections. Not necessarily the first person you'd expect to take on the mantle of Holocaust hero. Sardari had served as a junior diplomat in Paris beginning in 1937. As France fell to the Nazis just three years later, 26-year-old Sardari found himself promoted to the head of consular affairs, charged with the well-being of thousands of Iranians residing there. Within that group of Iranians were a couple hundred Jews. Many of these Jews had left Iran for Paris during the chaos of the Iranian Bolshevik Revolution, while others were lured by economic opportunity as merchants. Many lived well in Paris, owning large houses and hosting lavish holiday celebrations. But on September 27, 1940, their lives came crashing down when the Nazis issued an ordinance requiring all Jews of France to register with the police. Sardari had watched with alarm as the Nazis and French officials had ramped up their harassment and discrimination against non-Aryans. With the new law in effect, he knew the clock was ticking. Jews were dismissed from their jobs and barred from participation in public life. Vichy authorities seized Jews' property, leaving them penniless and disgraced. They began arresting foreigners of the Jewish race and carting them off to forced labor camps. The French government demanded that all Jews carry an ID card with the word Juif stamped in big red print. Sardari had no incentive to help the Jews. Nazi ideology stated that Iranians were related to the original Aryans and thus protected from the Nazis' racist laws. Sardari could have accepted the Nazis' designation and left the Iranian Jews to their fate. But he was the consul general for Iranians in Paris, for all Iranians. He knew the Iranian Jews in Paris, and he couldn't sit back and watch as they were targeted and tormented. He had to act. He had to protect his fellow Iranians, his fellow human beings, even if it put him in dire risk. So the young aristocrat did what he knew how to do best. He threw some raging parties, inviting German officials, Words and whiskey spilled freely at the embassy, and he quickly won the trust and friendship of many Nazi officers. But Sardari wasn't just a rich diplomat blowing through his family's money. No. He was strategically developing connections, laying the necessary groundwork to pull off his next deception, a deception which would need to work if he had any hopes of saving the Iranian Jews in Paris. A graduate of the University of Geneva with a doctorate in law, Sardari knew how to win a debate. You exploit your opponent's logic, until you've beaten them at their own game. And Sardari did just that. On official letterhead, Sardari wrote to the Vichy rulers. These so-called Iranian Jews, he explained, were not in fact racially Jewish as the Nazis had claimed. Jewish exiles had left Iran in 539 BCE with the Emperor Cyrus's permission. The current so-called Jewish community was actually made up of a group of purebred Iranians who over time had begun to find the teachings of the prophet Moses attractive and had decided to follow Mosaic practices. They were not Jews, but Jugudis, who by virtue of their blood, their language, and their customs are assimilated into the indigenous race and are of the same biological stock as their neighbors, the Persians and the Uzbeks. Only by virtue of their observance of the principal rites of Judaism, he claimed, could the Jugudis be confused with Jews. Therefore, these Jugudis should be considered as racially Aryan, just like all Iranians. Of course, the entire story about these Jugudis was a complete fabrication intended to fool the Vichy and Nazi officials. While Cyrus had allowed Jewish exiles to return to Israel in 539 BCE, not all of them did return. Many moved from centers in Babylon to Persian provinces and cities like Hamadan and Susa and remained Jewish throughout the centuries. 
Iranian Jews certainly didn't come from a large group of non-Jewish Iranians who decided to start following Mosaic practices, as Sardari had claimed. But Sardari had already earned the trust and friendship of local officials, and his clever use of the Third Reich's own twisted racial logic befuddled the Nazis so thoroughly that his claims climbed all the way up the Nazi ladder. The Racial Policy Department contacted the Research Institute for the History of New Germany, requesting further research into Sardari's claim. While his theories circulated through the Nazi bureaucracy, Sardari used the borrowed time to get to work. Taking advantage of blank passports and visas in the embassy's vault, he issued hundreds of Iranian passports that made no reference to religion, allowing Jews to escape undetected throughout Europe. In the meantime, the German researchers had concluded that more research was needed to investigate Sardari's claim that these so-called Jugudis were not in fact Jews. But everything changed in 1941. Britain and Russia invaded Iran, and Iran signed a treaty with the Allies. The Iranian government ordered Sardari to come home. He disobeyed. The Iranian government cut off his salary. He used money from his own inheritance. He often went without food, without money, without heat. Yet he kept using his influence and the German connections he had made to keep his office going and continue his life-saving work. It wasn't until 1942 that his arguments landed on the desk of Adolf Eichmann, the infamous SS officer who played a lead role in organizing Hitler's final solution. The Nazi official rejected Saudati's claims as the usual Jewish tricks and attempts at camouflage. The Nazis ripped away his diplomatic protection, but even that couldn't stop him. As the Nazis rushed to accelerate the final solution in France, hauling 100,000 French Jews off to death camps, Sardari intensified his efforts. He continued appealing on behalf of Iranian Jews, working with leaders of the Jewish community and Swiss diplomats. And miraculously, despite Eichmann's disapproval, German officials accepted Sardari's pleas. Soon enough, Vichy authorities followed suit, and the so-called Jugudis were exempted from anti-Jewish legislation. Sardari started with the Iranian Jews. After all, Iranian citizens were his responsibility as consul general. But then, Iranian Jews came to him begging to help their French and non-Iranian partners, and then their friends. A hero to the Iranian Jews in Paris, Sardari returned home a rebel. He spent 10 days in jail, charged with illegal acts for issuing visas to non-Iranians, until the Shah intervened to free him. When the Iranian revolution overthrew the Shah in 1979, he became a victim. The new Islamist government seized his property, robbed him of his ambassador's pension, and executed his nephew, the former prime minister. Filled with fear and praying that he would not be next, Sardari escaped to England. He died there in 1981, impoverished. A few years before his death, Yad Vashem had written to him, inquiring about his life-saving work. He responded simply, As you may know, I had the pleasure of being the Iranian consul in Paris during the German occupation of France. And as such, it was my duty to save all Iranians, including Iranian Jews. He was just doing his job, he said. He was just doing his duty. It's ironically similar to the claim many Nazis used to justify their evils. I was just doing my job, just following orders. But Sardari used his position to act righteously. He could have easily got along with the Nazis' claim that Iranian Jews were not like other Iranians. He could have easily stepped aside when Paris was engulfed in chaos. He could have gone home when he was commanded to return. He was Persian royalty after all. He could have gone back in peace and lived well with the cushion of his inheritance. But he didn't. He stepped up, not back. He forfeited his inheritance to buy safety for others. And he saved lives while risking his own.